swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. We are all about the entrepreneurs of endurance. Hey listeners, I've got something new for you today. We're joined by an award-winning outdoor lifestyle photographer who specializes in shooting adventure sports and capturing extraordinary images. He's worked with celebrated brands like Getty Images and Outside Magazine. He's here today to talk about some of those images as well as his experiences of growing his brand and advice for you would be endurance sports photographers. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sports business. Sports business. Welcome business. to the show, Mead Norton. Hi, thanks for having me on. Hey Mead, you are a long way from your original home. Where are you today? Today I'm in Rotorua, New Zealand. You don't sound which is like where you're I'm from. living now. Exactly. I was going to ask. You're not from Rotorua, New Zealand originally. Where are you from originally, Meet? Originally, I grew up in Texas, but I've been I've lived all over the states before I moved here to New Zealand. Excellent. Well, we'll talk about your story in a minute. But you're in a fantastic place. If you're a fan of outdoor adventure lifestyle. Rotorua is a fantastic place, isn't it? Not only is it on top of a volcano. I mean, I was there a few years ago, mountain biking, and some really, really challenging trails up there. Yeah, there's about 250 kilometers of trails in the forest here. Wow. Yeah, and, and not many people to share them with as well. So you've just got all that wildlife to yourself, right? Outdoors. Are you out there cycling regularly? Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I joke. I spend my office should be in the redwoods, um, in the forest here. Um, I spend so much time shooting and riding there. Awesome. Well, Mead, let's talk about some of your photographs first, because I want to picture some of these photographs for the listeners, so they can see what kind of stuff that you do, and then we can talk about how you get these shots and advice you have for people as well. So on your website, meadnorton.com, you've got this amazing photo of a kite surfer at sunset where this person is just immersed in this wave. It's a real action shot. What's going on here? Tell us a little bit about the story behind this photo. Yeah, this was um, actually a friend of mine um, organized this shoot uh, for Nash uh, Kites, a brand of kite surfing um, kites. And... This was when I was living up in Auckland, and I went off to Waiheke Island, which oh. is a 40-minute boat ride um, offshore from Auckland, and met up with a couple of the local kite surfers to photograph the kite surfing scene there, and them using the new Nash kites. And this, photo, this particular photo was one of the last of the day, or evening shoot that we did, and basically what I had told the told the guys was because I was shooting with a super wide angle lens from the water, mm. treading water as they sailed past is on this pass, come as close to me as possible and then do a hard, hard carve and spray me with as much water as possible. And that's how I captured that image. Did you get that in one take? Uh, that was about the third or fourth take. All right. But it was just, and every time it was telling him, no, come closer, come closer, come right. closer, till he basically was on top of me. Uh -huh. So it, there has to be a bit of rapport, a bit of chemistry between you and the people that you're s photographing, right? I mean, I'm wondering what it takes to take a good photo. Is it just being in the right place, capturing the light? or What's going on? What do you think makes you an award-winning photographer? Well, one of my things is the fact that of all the sports that I shoot, I've participated in mm. just about every single one of them. So I can talk to the riders and understand the sport from the athlete's perspective as well as from a photography perspective. So the fact that I understand that and what they're capable of and what would interest the viewers allows me to get more in-depth and more realistic shots than some other photographers um, who do the same thing that I do. Right. 
So how does that work? Because you're talking about stuff that we as the viewers, we as the consumers of your photography don't see. We don't see this stuff that goes on behind. So let's say, for example, if you were, I mean, you were a triathlete at one stage, we'll talk about that coming up as well. If you're taking photos of people doing an Ironman race, what is it that you see that, say, a, a bystander with a good camera and a good eye doesn't see? Um, well, it's the dynamic action of the sport that really attracts me hmm. to capturing the images, and so it's and it's the emotion and um, just the body positions. And because I'm that, I'm an athlete myself. I can see that and photograph it when they're in the right stride, um, when they're running or mm. when they're on their bike um, in the right position so that their legs, for example, on a, on a cycling photograph, when the legs are up and one leg is straight down, it doesn't look nearly as dynamic as if the legs, both legs are bent. Right. So it's got gotcha. It's the timing of when you press the shutter, as well as the facial expressions and the background and things like that as well that you capture. There's this great photo on your Instagram feed, which you took, I think, is in Tour of New Zealand this year, right? Yes. You've got a rider. I don't know who the rider is, forgive me, but he's coming up through the pass. And like you say, he's got both of his knees bent, his legs you haven't got, you know, they're both sort of at the same kind of level, but he's got a great expression on his face of just sheer, what is it? He's in the hurt locker. He's in pain going up this path. So you can really sort of feel that, that story going on at this point, right? Is that sort of, when you see that, are you consciously capturing that kind of emotion there and thinking, because, you know, I've been there. I know what this guy's yes. feeling, right? Yeah, exactly. That's it. Um, I've been there. I've done that. And it's and I place myself in the position in those in those locations when I'm scouting or when like for the tour of New Zealand example, I was chasing the racers each for each stage for a week across the South Island. Mm. And so I was in a car chasing them or um, in a couple of days up in a helicopter and it was looking for those p places along the course where they would be showing her or moving really fast or going around a corner um, that I was looking for to add that extra element to the images. Because mm -hmm. there's an interesting angle with your, your imagery, Mead, is that, you know, whilst you are photographing a lot of adventure sports, a lot of action sports, endurance sports, which are set in these amazing settings in New Zealand and all over. So you've got these huge landscapes, these panoramas. You're, it, you know, you have that backdrop, but you're focusing in on the emotions and the expressions of the individuals within that, right? And that sort of takes center stage where I guess normally people would go for like the big shot, right? You know, like get all the yeah. mountains and all that kind of stuff. You've consciously gone in and got the the human angle which is just really interesting i find that fascinating and i don't know if that's what photographers consciously do or that's just kind of your style well i think that's definitely my style is because i mean i love taking landscape photography but i'm a sports athlete i'm a sports photographer mm. and so my focus is always on the athletes and where and capturing the landscape but in relation to an athlete um, doing their sport. Mm. I want to talk about your sports in a minute, but first, I can't let that go by that incident in the helicopter, flying around in the helicopter. That must be pretty cool, huh? Uh, yeah. Um, I joke, I, I've yet to be in a helicopter with the doors on. Every time <laughs> I go up to shoot, it's always with the doors off so that you can get see the most and get the most scenery um, while you're hanging out from the side of the helicopter. You're hanging out the side of a helicopter shooting out of, with a telephoto lens type thing? Is that, I mean, yeah. I, I can picture it, right? That seems pretty dangerous. No, well, because you're still, um, you're, when I'm shooting, I'm usually, I still have a seatbelt on and I have a climbing harness and a tether clip to the um, back of the, to the floor of the helicopter as well. Right. So, um, you know, that, 
the pilots and th that I work with when I'm doing that, it's always safety first. And everything I do, it's always safety first. Right. First, making sure that when I'm shooting, the athletes are safe and then that I'm safe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. That must be quite an experience. Uh, do you have moments when you're doing that and you're sort of hanging out the helicopter, shooting these bike races and thinking, I'm getting paid to do this. Is this for real? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's it's what keeps me going um, in the down times and when, it, you know, when I'm just thinking why... It, photography is not the easiest job to do and it would be much simpler for me to be working in an office somewhere and getting a regular paycheck, but right. then I would have these amazing work stories mm. at the same time. And when you're doing this, do you ever feel like, oh, I wish I was back out there with these guys racing? Do you get that sort of draw or have you sort of found comfort with yourself now you're on the other side of the lens? Oh, uh, no, it's, it's always, I'm always jealous of athletes doing the races and um, a couple of times I've actually worked, worked it out so that I could do both at the same time. Um, How is that possible? With my, um, I've done a couple of ultra marathons, trail running races, where I've run with my camera and captured the race wow. from a, the runner's perspective. Wow. So I do the ra the whole race um, with the camera and take pictures along, along the way of the other racers and the trails and stuff. That's not a, like it, a, a small point and shoot camera, right? It's not a... You've got no, a I'm running with a, a mirrorless um, DSLR camera that I clipped to my running pack. Wow. Special um, camera clip that, to hold it. Okay, so how is that? I mean, you're doing an ultra, which is what, 50K plus trail run? 50K plus, yeah. And, and you're carrying this big camera with you at the time and you're, I mean, well, I can't imagine what that's like because just the whole equipment thing is a, a real pain in the ass anyway. Like I've been doing triathlon, right? Having to carry all this equipment and get all that sorted out the night before and then running with this stuff must be pretty tough. Yeah, um, it's definitely not for the faint hearted and I'm not, you know, I'll never be near the front of the pack and I'm not doing it for a time when I'm doing that, but it still gets me out there and gets me from along the whole course, which other photographers don't see the whole course. They only see, you know, bits and pieces that they can access from the road or from various trailheads. Mm. Okay. So, Let's put this into context. You were a semi-pro athlete at one stage. You were also, um, well, near the top of your age group as a triathlete as well. Let's talk about that because that kind of gives you an interesting backstory. You're not just a photographer, but you're somebody who's come from these sports as well. And that will hopefully lead us into your background as well, you know, coming from the States. So tell us a little bit about your sports background, Mead. Yeah, well, so growing up in the States, um, I grew up playing soccer and um, ended up playing for my university. At, and then after I left university, I played for a season with a semi-professional team in California. Um, and I also, as part of that, I did a lot of biking and running training in the off-season and so that's where, when I quit playing soccer, I went into, I got, I still wanted to do something physical and athletic, so I went into doing triathlons. Oh. And when I moved to New Zealand, I really got serious about it, and a lot of my best friends were some of the top triathletes. Oh. Um, and we, I started training with them, and the highlight of of my triathlon career was probably going to the Xterra World Championships in Hawaii, which is an off-road triathlon, um, and that was in 2009. You had to qualify for that? I had to qualify for that. So in Rotorua, there's um, one of the qualifying races takes place here, and I did that, and 
I placed in the top 10 of my age group, which enabled me to qualify to go to the Worlds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At that stage, did you ever consider becoming pro? Because if you were top of your, well, in your, your qualification slots for the age group, and you have a semi-pro background in soccer already, it's not completely new to you. Was that a thought in your mind? It was, it was a hope. Um, but then when I got there, I realized the the level of commitment and the fitness level and the speed jump from top age group to pro mm. was physically just not possible for me. Um, I just didn't have it in me to make that mm. and be successful at that level. So I had to give up that career or that dream. But it helped me with my photography career, though, because... I it, I still had that drive to go to these races and to see the courses and um, interact with the athletes. Mm. And, and with that background, I can talk to the athletes and understand them and, and their needs and also understand the needs and the wants of the, their sponsors and the brands that we're shooting for mm. as well. Mm -hmm. So... Your photography career, when did that take off? When did that start for you? Was it something that you were doing from a young age and then you started making money out of it? Or what's the story there? Um, basically, I grew up in an artistic family. My dad was an architect and a painter, and my mom was a semi-professional photographer. Hmm. So I was exposed to art and photography from a very young age. And... I basically made the decision when I was in high school that I wanted to become a professional photographer. And basically every decision I've made from then on in my life has helped me, led me down the path to become a professional photographer. Mm -hmm. So looking at your mom as a, an example of as well, you kind of knew maybe what it took and maybe some of the, the pitfalls as well with becoming a photographer. What was the transition like? When did you actually start getting paid for your photographs? Um, I basically, I kind of gave up on photography for a while but, um, and I was working as a web designer in California, mm. still doing photography on the side but um, not professionally. And then I went, on a course in Cuba with the National Geographic and um, decided, no, I wanted, and the bubble burst at the dot, in the dot-com industry and, lost, and I lost my job while I was on this trip to Cuba and I came back and had nothing to do. So I went back and um, studied photography at Brooks Institute in California, which was at the time, technically the most technically demanding photography school in the world. Mm. And I got my master's of science in photography from there. Okay. And then that's what started my professional career. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you are becoming a professional photographer. That can't be an easy thing to to do right i mean because i'm sure a lot of what i'm trying to get down to is a lot of people want to do what you're doing yeah but it's not just a case of having a good eye and being able to point the the camera in the the right direction that kind of, there's a lot more that goes into photography that we don't see right can you explain yeah. to us what goes on like i mean give us an example of a race that you've done recently and explain to us what it is that you do that an amateur doesn't do? Basically, it's an eight-day stage race that goes the length of um, this, well, that, the leg I was on went the length of the South Island, so we started in Queenstown and finished in Wellington, mm -hmm. and each day they were covering 100 to 150 kilometers a day. And so my day would start at about five in the morning um, to wake up, get to the start line, prep all my cameras, clean everything, 
and make sure all the memory cards were wiped and ready from the previous day's racing. And then it was covering the race, which would take anywhere from three to four hours. And then once the race was fin finished, it was getting straight to the hotel and getting to work uploading, downloading, editing, and uploading the finished images to Getty so that um, within three hours of finishing, I'd have edited selection of about 30 to 40 images that I had submitted online to Getty. Mm -hmm. um, do they give you a, do they give you like a, a shopping list beforehand? Like we want a photo of this, a photo of that, or do they just wait for you to no. give them what you've got? No, it's basically I decide what what would tell the best story. Um, and since so for Getty Images, their biggest customers are newspapers. So uh -huh. it's being aware what images would work for newspaper story on this race, or who who are the interesting people that are taking part that um, someone might be interested in using an image of to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, I'm doing the self editing and the captioning of all the images as well. So that when a newspaper editor uses it, they don't have to figure out who that athlete was or what they were doing, where they were, all that is already attached to the image. Mm -hmm. So you've got to kind of know what their, their needs are first as well. And you get kind of a feel for the kind of images that they like and don't like and so on. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you um and it's and it changes depending on who you're shooting for and what you're shooting for too. Um so it's talking with your with the clients and understanding exactly what their needs are. So if I'm working for for example, if I'm working for a commercial client or a brand, the type of images that I would be capturing would be totally different than what I'm capturing for Getty images hmm. and the newspapers. Sure. So how is it in your industry today? Is Because I imagine like the, you know, there's a certain type of photography that brings in the money. That's where people are willing to pay for. And then maybe there's also another type of photography, which is like the real dream ticket style stuff, like the, the Nat Geo assignment, right? Like you mentioned, yeah. like that's the kind of thing that everybody wants to do. But how, how is it now? I mean, for people who don't understand endurance sports photography extreme sports photography whatever what where is the money right now where's the growth areas the right now the biggest money is um just, and ha has always been with shooting advertising mm. so working with brands for the their commercials and their um working for their um catalogs and adverts that they post online and in magazines that's where the real money is um the money for editorial is has never been very good and it's still and it's gone the prices have gone down so um you can't make a living off of that but what it does it's an important part of my business because that's where I get my commercial work is right. through the editorial work. That's the marketing for you, right? Almost in a way. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's paid. The way I look at it is editorial work is paid marketing. Right. Gotcha. Well, what do you mean by editorial? Just so we understand for those who. Uh, it's anything um, for magazines or newspapers right. um, or online blogs, um, things like that. So that's where you get. Uh, the the price isn't very high for the payment, mm. but a the ad execs and art directors for those brands are looking at who's shooting what for what magazines, mm -hmm. and then and then the the more familiar uh, basically with photography, the more people see your work, the more likely you are to get work. Right. So and how does friend. that work? Do they see your photo and say like? get me in contact with this guy. Is that how it works? And you get a phone call from Red Bull or whoever. What's the system? Or do you have to go and hustle and knock on their door? Uh, if you're very, very lucky, they'll they'll come and knock on your door. But that's 
yet to happen to me. Um, it's usually I'm knocking, I'm finding my dream clients and doing research online to find what their emails are or what their Facebook pages are and just not really, not stalk them, but get into their worlds and get my work visible in their world so that when I do get an email address or a way to contact them, there's somewhat, they've seen my work or they know my name and they're familiar with who I am. They're warmed up to you. And how do you go exactly. about that when you are approaching a big client, a corporate client? How would you pitch that to them? Would you approach them face to face or would it be a, a phone call or email? What sort of things it's would you say? Usually, it's usually um, first it's an email introducing myself, sending a link to my work, um, things like that. And then it's, um, and then depending on what their response is, I then send out monthly, um, like three monthly mailers mm. out, um, postcards with uh, some recent work that I've been working on, and then just constantly posting to social media as well. So, for example, on my, my Instagram account, I'm posting five times a week, Monday to Friday, mm. a photo a day. And then that gets shared across all my social media channels mm -hmm. and reaches an audience of over 5,000 people. So you've got your Instagram account, you have your website, obviously you're going to events, you have email and all the other channels available to you. If you were yep. to just be able to do one thing to generate business, which is the one thing that you know, really is the, you know, that's the button that you push and that generates the most business for you. Out of all the things that you do, what is the most successful in terms of getting clients? It's probably going to big marquee events and networking with the people that are hanging around the events. Mm -hmm. So it's the, um, the people like um, at Crankworks this year in Rotorua, going around to all the um, the trade expo stall holders and networking with them and talking to them and introducing myself um, that I've been doing that for the last three years mm -hmm. at Rotorua um, Crankworks and that's gotten me some pretty big jobs just by doing that because they can put a face to a name right and then um, having that personal touch puts you that much further ahead than all the other thousands of photographers who send them emails and their online portfolios and website links and stuff like that. Exactly. Because now you're a human being rather than just an email, right? And how important that is. It's easy to send an email, but it's a lot harder to go out and meet somebody face to face, isn't it? Shake their hand. Exactly. And... I'm wondering how you go about that because something we talked about off air is you know i have photography friends and i find that they're really really good at telling other people's stories you know that's what photography really is all about it's capturing that story like we talked about that cycling image right somebody coming up the past you captured a moment in that person's story that emotion that agony on their face right mm -hmm. however when you turn the camera around and point it back at the photographer they're really out of their comfort zone. They're out of their depth because, you know, the, why, the, the reason why they're so uh, good at telling their stories is because they're also not used to, sorry, they're so good at telling other people's stories, they're not used to telling their own story, right? They really express themselves through these imageries of other people and what they do. So I want to know how you go about telling your story because if you're networking, you've got to do a bit of hustle, a bit of salesmanship. How does that come to you? Was it uncomfortable at first what kind of things have you learned to make yourself better at that oh it's definitely was totally foreign to me and uncomfortable um and you know it's been a lot of training to overcome the that my natural tendency to be an introvert um and a couple of the things i've done is um public speaking courses hmm as well as joining um, 
various network business networking groups that meet um, once a week or once a month, and then and it forces you to go and talk to and meet other business owners and promote your business to them and perfect what in the business world the what they call the elevator pitch. Right. And here's 30 second, 60 second description of what you do and why you do it. Mm. And what, hang on a second. You just said you're an introvert and you've also took public speaking courses. So yep. what happened there? That must have been pretty uncomfortable for you, right? What was the decision to do that? And how did you get over that? Uh, it was very uncomfortable for me, um, and it was I was just knowing that uh, it was one of the things that was letting me down in my business was my reluctance to make co cold calls for to clients and mm. to go and meet people face to face and be that salesman to generate more work, and so. Um, to make it as a professional photographer, I had to do that because no one was going to, no one was coming to me and knocking on my door and saying, "Oh, we love your work. We we want you to do do these shoots for us." It was everything was always me going to them and saying, "Oh, let's do this project together," or "I have an idea to do this." Mm. So to get better at that, I've had to to get more more work and to make make this a business I've had to get over my reluctance to do that mm -hmm. and so was that a decision that somebody advised you on or did you get to a point where you said look this is really holding me back and I can't take it anymore uh, a little bit of both um, I've I've used a couple of um, photography mentors who encouraged me to that you need to do the hustle yourself and mm. so then I looked at okay what's holding me back from doing that and it was my my shy, my my in inherent shyness hmm. and so to get over that i took these public speaking courses hmm. and, and how did you feel at the end of those courses did you feel a change um yeah it's still it's putting a mask on when right. i'm Doing it, it's not, it's never going to be natural for me. Um, but that's also, I think, part of why I'm such a good photographer is because instead of me being wanting to be the center of attention, right. I'm the observer watching and noticing the details of things. And so it's, it's a double edged sword. Hmm. It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? You know, what your strength, your strength is also your weakness in the sense that, you know, if you were an outgoing pitch type guy, right? If you were very good at being on the stage, that would necessarily probably make you a, a bad photographer because you would want to uh, be in the picture. No, is that what you're saying? Uh, not necessarily um, me personally, yes, but I know... Um, I'm no other photographers who are very outgoing and who are very ex successful, but they do tend to not necessarily be so sports oriented. Hmm. Um, they tend to be more the portrait um, wedding type photographers, right? Um, not so much the action sport. Um, documentary type photographers hmm. is that because their style is that they probably more intimate more involved with that person more you know a one-to-one -one conversation with that sort of yeah portrait well style? and with the portrait stuff it's also you have to be social and interacting with them um to get good images right. especially when you're working with um people who aren't used to being photographed because the number one thing to get a good photograph of someone, especially for a portrait, is that they're relaxed. Um, and as soon as you put a camera in front of someone, they all, a lot of people who aren't used to it, they get really tense. Yeah. So you have to develop ways of um, getting them to relax and forget that there's a camera in front of their face. Right. And that's their photos taken. 
Gotcha. So you have to be confident for them to relax as well. Exactly. So these are all the kind of things that you learn in your trade as you as you grow as a photographer. So I wonder yeah. if there's any other sort of advice that you could offer, because I imagine there's people listening to this interview now who are starting out as photographers, who are looking at you and you, you're further down that path than them, or maybe they're thinking about, yeah, I love photography. I want to make a living out of it as well. Can you, yeah. I know we don't have enough time to go into full depth because you're, I'm asking you to see Constantina many, many years of experience into a few minutes of advice. But if you were sitting with somebody now, and maybe it's a younger Mead, you know, let's go back 20 years. What sort of advice would you offer him to help him get up that learning curve faster and maybe avoid some of the avoidable pitfalls that you may have sort of strayed into? Yeah, well, probably the number one thing is if you do want to be a, a photographer is do find your niche, find what you're passionate about taking pictures of and figure out a way and look at who's making money doing that and how can you do do that as well because hmm. there's nothing worse than a lot of beginning photographers think they need to do all kinds of photography they need they want to do still life they do landscape they do portrait they do action and those aren't the successful photographers the most successful photographers focus on one or two specialties and those specialties are what they're passionate about and that they love doing and that those are the things that they'll photograph even if they don't have a job on. Hmm. So, so when one. you say that you're passionate about it, you mean something that, like you, you did something in sports, whether it's triathlon or Xterra, that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that you should start thinking about doing photography on? Yeah, so if you're, if you're a passionate football fan... Um, and you go, you're always going to um, soccer matches and um, you want to take photos of that, then that's one thing. But if you're passionate about that and then you go and do portraits, you're not going to be very good because that's not what you're passionate about. Like I make a horrible portrait and wedding photographer. I've done it in the past, but I'm not good at it. Hmm. Because that's I'm not passionate about weddings and taking people's portraits, but you get me out on a ruddy, muddy mountain bike trail in the middle of the forest in the pouring rain, slipping and sliding um, down a trail, and I'm loving it. Hmm. And I can't wait to do it again next weekend. Awesome. So find your niche. That's the number one piece of advice. What else? Is there any sort of big mistakes that you've made as a photographer that are avoidable? Probably the biggest mistake I've ever made is a not being prepared for a shoot and showing up to a shoot without um, spare batteries and spare memory cards. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is also is not being hard enough on yourself um, when you're editing your portfolio, especially when you're going to um, approach your dream client. You want to make sure that your portfolio is the very, very best that you can it can be, um, because these people see thousands upon thousands of images every day. And if you really want to make an impression, yours has to stand out above all of those. So it's um, being very hard on, your, on yourself and on your images and developing a very thick skin because people are going to t say no to you. And if you let that get you down and if, if you take that personally, then you're never going to get better at that. You know, and you're never going to get over it, and you're going to stop submitting your images, and then you'll never get other work. That's tough, but that's good advice, eh? And that's something you you have to learn yourself the hard way, isn't it? You have to yep. take rejection and not take it personally, because you know it may just be that person, that timing just wasn't right, and you 
and you just have to move on, right? I mean, just give us a feel for the kind of numbers. I know we kind of hear about these parallels with people in book publishing and in music. You know, they visited X number of publishers and, you know, it was on the 100th visit that they got a, a yes. Is, is it tough like that in photography as well? Do you have to go through a lot of no's, a lot of rejections to get to yeses? Um, it depends. The more targeted your approaches are um, to the right clients and your work matches what they're looking for, then the more the less no's you get. But if you just blank it and you don't do enough research to find those target markets, then, um, then yeah, you will get a lot of no's. Um, to give you an idea, I have a database of over 3,000 people that I send um, uh, my monthly mailer out to. And some of those people I've never gotten work from, but I keep them on my mailing list. And every month I get a, an update of what I'm doing and who I'm talking to or where I'm going next and what I've been shooting just in case they have a job that comes up. Mm -hmm. But that's, and some of those people, after putting them on, getting one, one of my mailers, I've gotten jobs from them. Right. From one, from one contact. Whereas others, I haven't gotten any, and they've been on there for four or five years. But that doesn't mean they're not going to come through, right? I think that's kind of important advice, isn't it? With those contacts, you've just got to keep in their radar and it might just not be the right time right here, right now. But years down the line, they may come through and say, right, who do I know that does this kind of photography? Ah, this guy that keeps sending me these mailers, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's my, my marketing is, you know, it's not just w one thing and done. It's a regular, regular contacts with them. And I also try to... I try to organize even face-to-face -face meetings with some of them that are more local to me um, and go up to Auckland every couple of months and just to go to meetings and um, just show them my latest work mm -hmm. so that you're front of mind when those jobs do come up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, that's so important. And I think that's kind of the craft that you've learned as a professional photographer, isn't it? How important all of that is that, you know, you don't have anybody to market you apart from you, right? You know, if, yeah. you, if you work for a large organization or a corporate, they would be marketing you because you would be operating under their brand, right? But yeah, you exactly. have to go out there and, and do that yourself. Do you enjoy that environment? Do you sometimes think, oh, I wish I had a, a comfortable job, you know, and that could all be taken care of? Oh, definitely there are times when I wish that was the case. Um, but at the same time, if that was the case, then I wouldn't have nearly as many amazing experiences and work stories as I have um, and go on as many adventures as I do. Oh man! So it's, exactly. It's a, def it's a it's a double. It's a trade off. Exactly. But I think you've got the balance right. I mean, if you were to look at your experiences, look at your Instagram feed, your portfolio, and your website, none of that's worth trading in to get a a, a corporate salaried life, is it? it looks like you're really living the dream out there in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I've, I've done that. I've been there and done that. I've worked in an office, and it was soul-destroying for me. And it's just not for me. So I, I've been on, been on the other side of it and decided that it wasn't for me, and I'm now doing everything in my power to ensure that I don't have to go back to that. Exactly. Well, I think your story has been inspiring. I'm sure there are people sitting in offices today listening to this, looking out the window thinking, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do what Mead's done doing. I want to live that kind of lifestyle, escape 
somewhere crazy like Rotorua on the other side of the world. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? So, me, thanks so much for joining us today. Where do we find out more about you? Um, you can find me on my website, meadnorton.com, and also across Instagram and Facebook at Mead Norton Photography. Excellent. Awesome. So, um, and if you go to my w website, you can also sign up and get onto my monthly mailing list as well and you'll see my latest adventures and upcoming trips fantastic that is me norton everybody professional photographer go and check out those links as he has described to you and you know keep us updated me on your adventures It'd be great to get you back on the show in the future and see what's going on in your life what kind of crazy experiences you're having and share those with us so please come back on a future show Mead Norton everybody thanks so much for coming on the show today no worries thanks for having me Endurance FM voice of the endurance sport business find out more at www.endurancefm.com